Welcome back to another episode of Healed, Hold, and Happy. I am your host, Vianney Montero, and we will continue with this part two of the Zachary King conversion story. He has been interviewed by EWTN and many Catholic stations. After spending 26 plus years in organized Satanism and a deep involvement in the occult, he tells us how he experienced a powerful conversion by the power of the Blessed Mother and by the Miraculous Medal. Welcome back, Mr. King. Me and my ex-wife were at the church. We were there for confession. And I was in line. I was like third person in line. It was almost my turn. She walks ahead of me and she picks up this trifold paper off the wall, gets a pencil and starts looking at it. I said, what's that? She said, an examination of conscience form. What's that? That doesn't tell me what that is. She said, it's a list of sins. See, it'll help you during your confession. Well, I knew what I was going to confession for, but I said, well, let me look at it. And so I started looking at it and it's the 10 commandments and then all the subheadings under each one of those sections as do additional sins. And you're supposed to, you know, also examine yourself. Did you do something that's close to what's on here? Because it might say um, having a tarot reading done but it doesn't say going to a seance. Well, you should know that going to a tarot reading is like going to a seance. So it's similar. So you could include that. You know, there's also a space for you to write down sins that you may have done or that you question, was this a sin? Or write it down when you go and see the priest, you tell him everything you've checked off. But now I go in there and like I said, I know not to do uh, spiritual warfare type stuff on the other side. You know, I know not to do a tarot deck or um, go to a seance or go to a psychic. But I start reading through everything and realize that I have sinned 37 times and didn't know these were mortal sins. The examination of conscience form is only mortal sins. It's only if you do this sin and you don't confess it, you're going to hell. And I realized that I was going in to confess one thing. And now I'm not. I'm going in to confess 38 things. You know, I didn't know some of the things I did were mortal sins, you know, and there's things on there. Now, this wasn't something I was guilty of, but did you know it's a mortal sin to make fun of somebody that's handicapped? I'm handicapped. I make fun of myself all the time, but you're allowed to make fun of yourself. Don't make fun of somebody else. You know, making fun of somebody else is equal to thou shalt not kill. That's under thou shalt not kill. Wow. You know, so making fun of somebody that's mentally handicapped or physically handicapped is equal to killing someone. You know, and I was like, whoa, you know, like I didn't know that. I don't make fun of people, but finding that out because I didn't Kids know nowadays are doing it. Children are they, they have all these memes online um, about handicapped and they make fun. Even right. in school, high school, junior college, it, it's funny. Oh, let's let's just make fun. And and I had no idea it was a more fun. Well, when I was when I was a kid, my brother was special needs, and I made fun of my brother relentlessly. I was terrible. I was the worst person in the world. I made fun of my brother for everything. However, in my house, my dad treated my brother like he was the best person in the world and the greatest person in everything. No matter what he did, he couldn't fail. He couldn't do anything wrong. I, however, was in trouble every day. But this is what I grew up with. When I was three years old, we had cats and dogs in the house. And I could imitate the cat so well that the cats would all run into the room to see where this other cat was. And my mom was amazed. So my mother tells my dad, you know, we're getting ready to eat dinner. And she says, watch what he can do. And so I did the sound and all the cats ran into the kitchen. My dad doesn't praise me for it. He just tells my brother, why don't you try it? Why don't you try and do that same thing that, that your brother's doing? And my brother doesn't want to do it. You know, and he, he's, like I said, he's special needs. He can't, you know, back then, 
it was normal for my brother to be called mentally retarded. And that was the normal phrase back in the 60s and even in the 70s. So my brother had to imitate it, but it doesn't sound like a cat. And none of the cats are fooled. They're not, they don't come back into the room. But my dad tells my brother, that sounded exactly like your brother. That might have even been better than his. Yeah, I think that is. That's better than your brother's. He doesn't take me aside and explain that your brother's mentally challenged. He can't do the same thing as you. I just get that that sound he just made is better than the one I did. I started crying and went to my room. I spent the night in my room. I didn't want to come out. So you're carrying a father wound. Right. Well, I've, got, I've gotten over a lot of that. I went to Rachel's Vineyard retreat and we went over a lot of the, the wounds of my dad. You know, one of the examples of something my dad did uh, that related to my brother, my dad asked me where his pH balancing testing kit was. I was about eight years old. I don't even know what he's talking about. And I tell him, I don't know what that is. He's screaming at me. What did I do with it? And he insists he knows that I hit it. I'm playing with it. I probably broke it. And now I'm scared to give it to him. And I don't know what he's talking about. I don't know what this box is. He's screaming at me at the top of his lungs in my face. And I'm starting to cry. My mother comes home, wants to know what's going on. And I'm telling her, I don't know what dad's talking about. He's asking me about something I've never seen him before. My dad slaps me across the face, full on palm of his hand, side of my face, knocks me to the side. While all of this is going on, my brother walks up front. Now, this is at my dad's business. My brother walks up and he says, oh, I know what happened to that. And he opens up. We have this horizontal freezer. My brother opens that up and says, it was here. And when I leaned over to get milk, I knocked it in the freezer and it landed on the floor of the freezer. And I'm too short to reach down there and get it. I was afraid I would fall in and not be able to get back out. It's right there. My dad looks in there, sees the kid, reaches down, gets it out, and I get no apology. No, oh, I was wrong. Sorry I slapped you across the face. Sorry I called you a liar. Sorry I screamed in your face. He just now is happy that he got his pH testing kit. Here it is. My brother knew where it was the whole time and waits until after I've been slapped and yelled at before he tells my dad where it is and he knows about it. And my mother made him apologize to me and he refused to apologize. She yelled at my dad, for it. you need to tell him you're sorry. And he says, uh, he knows I'm sorry. You know, and she says, well, he knows you're sorry in a certain way, but he doesn't know that you're apologizing. And he refused to apologize to me. He says, you know, that'll, that'll be a freebie. One, one day he'll do something bad and I'll just let it go. And that'll be because of this, you know, and so he wouldn't apologize to me. So because of that, because of incidents like that, I made fun of my brother like it was my job. So it's Be like you're taking revenge, like you're, you just want yeah. to hurt Right. I, just, I wanted him to feel a sample of what it is it felt like to be me, to our dad. However, now, despite me saying all that, I also felt like I was allowed to make fun of my brother. No one else is allowed. My dad came into my room when I was 13 years old and told me that my brother got bullied in the park and the three boys are still there. Put your fighting clothes on. We're going to go back and teach those boys a lesson. I got dressed in what I thought would be good fighting clothes. And I was in karate at this point. My dad put me in karate when I was eight years old. So I thought, all right. So I got dressed. My dad took me back to the park. He says, I want you to run around to the opening, the gate, and walk in that way. I was like, why I got to do that? Why can't I just hop the fence like everybody else? He goes, all right, fine. Hop the fence. He goes, and those are the three boys. I want you to beat them up. Okay. So I hopped the fence, went over, and I said, hey, did you guys beat up a kid earlier? I'm like, yeah. Yeah, we beat him up. And we just kind of like made him get down on his knees and crawl around. Wouldn't let him stand up. And uh, he came home with grass stains all over his pants. But my brother's not a narc. He wouldn't say what happened to him. 
He just said he was at the park. What happened at the park? Nothing. I went to the park. I'm, I'm asking these boys what happened. They confessed what they did. And I said, well, you see that guy standing next to that truck? That's our dad. That kid you beat up was my brother. Now I have to beat you guys up. And, you know, they're like, oh, yeah, sure. And remember, I'd been in karate since I was eight. I got up my first black belt when I was 14. I was 13 for this. And so I had a brown belt at this point. This kid swung on me and I blocked his that punch and then got loose on these three guys. Now, these kids, I'm 13. My brother at this point was 18 years old in high school. These three boys are all in high school. They're like 17, 18 years old. So I'm beating up adults and I'm 13 years old. I'm also small for my age. So at 13, I was built probably about like a nine or 10 year old. So they're getting their butt handed to them by a little kid. And two of them are knocked out. One's on his knees crying. I don't care. That's what my dad told me to do. So I walked back around, hopped over the fence. Fence is about four or five feet tall. So there's these big cement barrels in front of them. So you stand on a barrel and then you hop the fence. So I did that, came up to my dad. He gave me a high five. One of very few that he ever given me in my entire life. So he gives me a high five. And I said, I noticed that there was a deputy talking to you. And um, he goes, yeah, I learned a new phrase today. I said, what was it? And he goes, small town frontier justice. He said the deputy came up and talked to me and he said that they got the first call that your older son was being beat up by three bullies. And so I was trying to get over here, but I didn't have time. I had other stuff to do. And then we got another call that your youngest son was beating up the three boys. So the sheriff sent me to talk to you and let you know that the three boys that beat up your older son will not be prosecuted because your youngest son beat up the three boys. And that's an example of small town frontier justice. They won't be charged and your youngest son won't be charged. It's all equal. If the older boy's parents want to press charges, they'll be told that they can't because the three boys beat up on your son. So that's a crime. And why aren't charges being brought against your youngest son well, because he was being vindictive to get revenge, you know, so he said, small town frontier justice. And I was like, all right. And then my dad asked me, what do you want for dinner tonight? And I said, what are my options? He goes, anything you want, you tell me what you want. I'll have your mother fix it. So when we got home, he told my mom, you need to feed him these things tonight. Make sure he gets the fried chicken, the fried okra, mashed potatoes, and anything else that you got that, you know, that goes with that meal. So that's what I got that night. And I got that from beating up three boys. It celebrated. So yeah, we celebrated for for beating these guys up because they messed with my brother. But that was also my mentality. I was allowed to make fun of him. I could do to me, I could be relentless. He never cried. He would get upset, but he wouldn't cry. So I knew how far I could push him and get away with it. But I also knew that if anybody else, I, I had told my brother what, what would happen. And he knew what would happen. So a few years ago, me and my wife at the time, not the wife I have now, but my, my last ex-wife, Katie, we had moved down to Florida to move my parents into a new house. And she found all these pictures of us as kids. And you, we basically look the same as we did as young kids as we do now. We just look like the older, more adult version now. Like, you know, I didn't have a beard back then, but my face looks the same. You know, I just look older now. My brother looks exactly the same. You know, he never grew facial hair. So his everything about him looks the same as he did when he was nine years old. So... My wife finds this stuff and she said, I found these pictures of your kids. My dad looks at the photo. This is like 2012. And he says, I've never been able to tell the difference in them in photos, which is weird to me because my brother doesn't look anything like me. 
Like we look, you couldn't even guess we're in the same family. And we look that much apart. And my brother looks the same now as he did when he was his entire life. And basically I do too. So my dad said, I can't tell the difference. And my wife scoffs and goes, you're kidding me. They look the same now. This is clearly Jack or Jackie. And this is Zachary. And he goes, how can you tell? And I said, because that one looks and this one looks normal. And my dad goes, he's been like this his whole life. His whole life, he makes fun of his brother. It's never stopped. And I said, he doesn't care that I make fun of him. He knows I love him. And he goes, no, he doesn't. No, he doesn't. He, he, you hurt his feelings every time. I said, you don't know your son very well. How, how is that possible? He's lived with you his whole life. How do you not know him? And, and so I call my brother out of his room. You know, and he comes out and he's like, yes. I said, does it bother you when I make fun of you and I call you? No. Said, Why not? Because I know you love me. And I looked at my dad and I smiled and I said, see? I said, and what happens if somebody else makes fun of you or messes with you? And he gets all happy and he goes, you'll kick their ass. <laughs> and my dad is like, oh, my God, I forgot about that, too. Said he beat up three boys in a park. I said, Well, who told me to beat him up? You did. And he goes, I admit that. I, I took him back there in the truck and he beat him up. I said, Also, there was that kid at the rec center. He goes, Oh, yeah, forgot about him. There was this kid that bullied my brother. And my brother got in trouble because he told the kid, If you mess with me, my brother's going to beat your ass. And so they locked my brother up in detention because he cussed. And so when we got there to pick up my brother, we're like, where's my brother? And he's like, he's in detention. I was like, what for? My brother's never done anything wrong. And they said that well, he told some boy that if he messed with him anymore, he'd get his ass kicked. I was like, really? So now I'm interested because that means I'm going to go beat somebody up because my brother was basically telling him the truth. And so he points out this kid out in the, out in the yard and he's got like eight or 10 kids on their knees in front of him with their hands like they're praying, looking at him. And my dad pats me on the back and says, go have fun. I, like, I will. So I run out there. And he's telling these kids to worship him, pray to me, I'm your God. Wow. He's got eight to 10 kids, boys and girls, on their knees telling them, pray to me, I'm your God. I trot up to him when I'm almost to him. I run at him full tilt and punched him in the face. I'm 14 years old, maybe, 13 or 14. And I decked him in the yard. Bam! He went right down. I turned to those kids and I went, your God is dead. And I turned back and walked back to my dad. And my dad gives me a high five. We get my brother. And this guy starts to tell my dad something. And my dad says, that boy had those kids out there worshiping him like he was a god. And he bullied my son. You want to sue me? I'll turn the name of this place into my last name. You'll be fired. And we walked out. And my dad gave him his attorney's business card and talked to the attorney later. And the attorney said, no, they never called. So I got to beat up that guy. And again, I got you know, the food that I wanted to get. But, you know, fast forward 40 years, practically, you know, and my dad's like, yeah, he beat up three boys in a park and he beat up uh, this other kid at a recreational center. One punch took him down. And, um, you know, and there, my brother conflict makes my brother happy. So he likes watching everybody loves Raymond for the in-laws because they bicker back and forth or Seinfeld uh, the Costanzas, uh, the parents and the son, because of the conflict they have, uh, bewitched for the mother-in-law in Dora, not liking the son-in-law, you know, because they like to fight and argue. And that kind of stuff gives my, my brother pleasure. So there's a fight going on because of him. He's happy. He's all in. And when he hears arguing and stuff like that, He'll be jumping up and down on his tippy toes, clapping his hands. 
you know, so when, you know, being confronted with and what happens if somebody else, you know, does that to you. And he's like, so happy about it, you know, and my dad, you know, it's just like, he's done this his whole life. And I was like, you know, you, you didn't seem all that, you didn't mind all that much when I beat him up. It was okay. Fair enough. You were at your friend's house and they're grooming you. So what happened next? So I was going to be in these movies and, you know, every time that they showed me still pictures or little loops or full length movies, it was always kids in a room watching it. So I assumed even when I was watching the movies, you know, and being in the movies, I assumed it was kids that was watching them. It never occurred to me that adults would be watching these movies because the only adults in the room were the one that put it in the VCR, but it was always kids watching. So it never occurred to me that adults were watching these movies. You know, I was, we would get letters from around the world requesting us to do certain things, certain acts. All the actors had a name. You had a fake name that went on the screen. Wow. We're, you know, I'm, I also found out that when I was, I think it was around 13 years old. It might have been still 12, though. The woman that abused me when I was 11, I saw her in my coven in this meeting. I got upset, and I, she smiled at me as if nothing ever happened. And I went to one of the coven members that I, I knew and trusted and said, um, the woman that abused me is here. I, I, I can't come back here if she's going to be here. And so they talked to her and made her leave so i would be comfortable there so she might have still been there but i didn't see her there anymore but you know i was doing these movies and we did them in the town i grew up in and there's surrounding towns and we would do them in surrounding towns as well buildings just by normal people they look normal they're going to church they're well integrated in the community so no one thinks that they're doing this. My parents knew almost all of the adults in my coven. You know, they went to my church or they worked in the community. You know, it's not a huge town. My town probably has, in the 70s, probably had about 4,000 people. You know, there's somebody from every section of town in my coven. And... Everybody on the outside knows everybody that's in there. They just don't know it's a coven. At this point, you still you don't know it's a coven, though. Yeah, I don't know that. I'm, you know, I'm 12 years old, and I'm enjoying eating bags of potato chips every day. Yeah, I'm, I'm enjoying myself. I do this sometimes every day, sometimes just on the weekends. But it was happening at least once a week, because at least once a week, we shot videos. After doing this and smoking cigarettes almost every day, um, my mom would give me a large orange juice every morning and take me to school. Sometimes, though, she would give me a large orange juice and I would walk to school. And on days that I walked to school, I would stop by one of the houses for my friends and we'd half fill up my cup of OJ with vodka. So I'd be there with a large screwdriver in class. And my teacher knew I'm a good kid. I make A's for the most part. And I'm drinking orange juice. They never thought to open it up and look at it. They never thought that they should take a sip of it. I did have a friend one day say, can I have a sip of that? Sure. And she took a sip and she was like, what's in there? <laughs> I was like, it's just OJ. I knew it was half vodka. By the time we were leaving that class, the effects had kicked in and I had to help her to get to the next class. The one big gulp for a little girl made her a little tipsy. Right. And, um, and, and this I drank. This is normal life for you. This is normal. By the time I shared that drink with her, I'd been getting hammered like at least once a week. And you're what, 13 at this point? 12, 13. 12, still 12. And yeah, I was. Um, I was popping pills. I was dropping acid. I'm and smoking. all of this is given to you at this house that you were at? Yeah. yeah. My, now, remember, though, too, that my dad taught me as a kid, never take the first drink because you could be an alcoholic and not know it. 
Well, I wasn't an alcoholic because I didn't have to have these drinks. I just liked to. Mm -hmm. I even proved myself one month. I went without drinking for a month to see if, am I jonesing for it? And I, I didn't. My dad told me that every drug there was could kill you. Well, I smoked marijuana first. Didn't kill me. Pop some pills. Don't even know what they were. So you're just trying to prove like everything wrong. You wanted to know for yourself. Yeah. I, I wanted to, is, is my dad right about everything? Right. So the pills that I took made everything brighter and more colorful. The acid I took made me see amazing things. I was threatened that this would kill me. And this is what it's doing instead. You know, smoking weed made you high. Taking mushrooms actually would make you high and hallucinate. And I'm having a great time doing all this stuff. Or drop acid, take MDMA, and then have sex. It was like being on another planet. And all of life was good. And I couldn't understand my dad telling me, this could all kill you. You know, had my dad known I was doing this, he would have killed me. But he was either wrong or lying to me. You know, because nothing I did ever made me sick. One thing I did, I took a couple of pills, took a couple of steps, and got so tired, I couldn't make it to the bed. I collapsed on the floor. And then I'd been asleep for about 12 hours when they took me home. Wow. And my parents were never suspicious of anything because I still made A's and B's in school. You're doing uh, well at school, but all of this is happening in your life at this age. Right. How, how long does this last? Well, being in the movies lasted four and a half years. Wow. You know, I did that from 12 years old to 16. Uh, being still 12 years old and smoking cigars, pipes, bongs, cigarettes, uh, taking all kinds of drugs. This older kid, probably like 15 or 16, ran up to me one day and said, you know, you're in a satanic coven, right? And he took off running. And this I is just, in the house, the same household? Yeah, same house. I just laughed it off. You know, because, I mean, remember that even if, let's go back to the Adam West Batman show. I don't know if you ever watched that. Batman is always upright because his character is upright and he's just, he's justice. He's law enforcement. He's the good guy. And then when the Joker or the Penguin or the Catwoman was on the screen, the screen was tilted because the bad guys are crooked. And, you know, it's like you'd think that being as a kid that you're discovering that your dad's not right about everything or he lied about everything. You know, so... Marijuana doesn't kill you. None of these pills killed me. None of these drugs have killed me or even made me sick. Are these really the bad guys? My dad told me that these foods I was eating would all kill me. Well, none of the food killed me either. Everything I did was the worst thing in the world for me. My dad never got it through his head that not everything can be the worst thing in the world. And there was just a constant butting of the heads with my dad. But me being over there doing everything that he told me not to do, everything that he said would kill me or hurt me in some way was fine. And now suddenly I hear this is a satanic coven and, you know, Satan's supposed to be the bad guy, but he doesn't seem to be all that bad. Like my, my parents are telling me everything I'm not to do. Same thing as, you know, that Bible we've got, that's a book of what you can't do. You're not allowed to do magic. You're not allowed to kill. You're not allowed to steal. You're not allowed to lie. You know, it, you see a bicycle and no one's ridden it for three weeks. It's still parked at school. Why can't I get on it and ride it around for a while? What's the harm in that? But God doesn't say I can do that. God says thou shalt not steal. Leave it there. I'm not hurting anybody by taking it. But I, if I'm listening to God, I'm not even going to look at the bike. So you're at this age where you're testing everything. They're telling you this, but you're right. testing it for yourself. And you're saying, well, this isn't harming me. I'm okay. I'm actually feeling good. So right. why are you telling me that I shouldn't? This is your view at this time. This is how you're viewing right. the world. You know, it's like my parents are either lying to me or they don't know the truth. Right. You know, which is it? I don't know. 
they're letting me not do anything that I want to do. Satan lets me do everything I want to do, you know, and, and I can't go talk to my Baptist preacher about it. And I can't go talk to my parents about it. You know, what am I going to tell my dad? By the way, dad, I'm having sex every day. Is that okay? You know, I just picture my dad clutching his heart and keeling over dead. You know, like what would their perspective be? Mm -hmm. You know, and eventually you realize what you're doing is not okay. But it's not okay. It's okay where you are. It's not okay to the status quo. Mm -hmm. You know that your parents would punish you for it. But you know where you are in this room. It's okay to act that way. Right. There are certain places where you can act like everybody else is acting. But when you get out in the real world, you can't act that way. For example, it doesn't have to be something bad. You can wear a cowboy hat and blue jeans and a Western shirt and a cowboy belt and a giant belt buckle and cowboy boots and yell yeehaw at the, at the top of your lungs if you're at a rodeo. When you leave that and go to the corporate world, you cannot dress like that and you cannot walk down the hallway and yell yeehaw at the top of your lungs. That's right. <laughs> you are looked at kind of odd. There's something wrong with you and someone will come up and talk to you and maybe walk you out of the building. You're just not filling in for the status quo. Mm -hmm. You're not doing what you should where you should. And when if you're you doing all of this, isn't it taking a toll on your body? You're not like more exhausted because of the drugs of what you're doing. I mean, for you, it's normal in this house, like you said. It's normal in this house. It's accepted in this house. Right. But when you go home over the weekend, you're, you as a child, 12 years old, you're not tired. I'm tired, but I'm not realizing that it's, you know, I'm taking a toll on everything that I'm doing. Mm -hmm. you know, it's not really occurring to me. And, you know, I'm studying hard. I'm, I'm making good grades. And my dad is still making me, I have chores to do or jobs to do at the house. And he's still having me do them. You know, and they're telling me, do whatever it is he asks you to do. Continue going to church. Mm -hmm. You know, continue getting good grades. You know, don't let your parents get suspicious that you're doing something you shouldn't be doing. Mm -hmm. You know, had my dad come to me and said, has anyone ever showed you a magazine with dirty pictures in it? I'd have to ask him. I'd have to sound as innocent as I could and Why? say, dirty picture of what? You know, I'd have to sound as naive as I possibly could be. Mm -hmm. But my dad never asked me anything like that. You know, but then... A couple of weeks, maybe three weeks after this kid had said, you know, you're in a satanic coven. I got to thinking, am I in a satanic coven? Because one night I saw two people walking through this house in a black robe with the cow raised up. They looked like somebody from a satanic coven I saw in a movie. And I didn't know, are they going to some costume party somewhere or what is that? And it wasn't everybody in the room. It was just them too. I, I didn't see anything else like that, but but it got me curious. And I walked up to um, an older Satanic Coven member that I knew, and I said, um, I got something for you. You're going to laugh. I said, I heard this was a Satanic Coven. Crazy, right? And I expected him to burst out laughing and just pat me on the back and say, get out of here, you young scamp. But instead, he said, it is. And my heart the sunk truth, into my The truth is revealed to you. So what do you do with this information? No, you know you're in a coven. What do you do? What happened? My, my heart sunk into my stomach. And I got instantly terrified. And I was like, a am I a member? No. Would you like to be? See, this is where Satan gets you because he's gotten me so that I, I can eat anything I want anytime I want, I, I can do anything that I want. You know, I'm smoking cigarettes like every day. I'm smoking cigarettes and cigars and pipes at least on the weekend. Got to be 19 to buy tobacco. I'm still 12. And I'm drinking almost every day. If I quit, all that's going to go away because I can only have that sex in this coven. Mm -hmm. I lose all these privileges 
that remember my dad said all this would kill me and it doesn't. So all this stuff that I love to do, I don't get to do anymore if I quit. In my mind, I'd be the world's biggest dope if I quit. Like I'd be an idiot. What do I have to do to be a, to be a member? And he told me that there were 13 steps involved in being a satanic covenant member. They're different if you're a child versus an adult. And me being a child, I had done almost all 13 already. All I had left to do, I had to slice my left thumb and bleed onto a document. And on the final page of a five-page document, I agreed to sell my soul to the devil. Wow. But now, I'm not certain at this point that the devil is real. I didn't read about Jesus in, in school. I took history in there. I took world history. There's nothing in world history that talks about Jesus dying on the cross. Mm -hmm. So you learn about it at one setting, but you don't learn about it in the setting where you're supposed to learn. Right. So is it real? I don't know. <laughs> it's a very confusing time for me. And selling my soul, sure, why not? I mean, is it really worth anything anyway? And I'm going to live to be probably 9,500 years old. Maybe there's time to change my mind. Now, it says in the document you can't. Once you've sold your soul to the devil, Satan forever owns it, and you couldn't change your mind. You couldn't go to God even if you want to. You can't do it. And I believe that. I was 13 years old when I signed all this. I believe that all this was true and accurate. Now, when I'm at my conferences and I'm giving my talk, I stop here and I ask the person, I always have somebody sitting to my left or to my right, and I ask them what kind of car do they drive? Like my wife drives a Honda Pilot. So then I ask the audience, who here can legally sell me my wife's Honda Pilot? And people want to clarify, legally. Yes, I said legally. Can you legally sell me this car? No. Why not? Because it's not ours. Right. 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 You can't legally sell me what you don't own. It's the same reason you can't sell your soul. God died for you. Jesus paid the ultimate price for your soul. You don't own it. You Thank can't. Thank you for clarifying that. Because, <laughs> because people do believe that they can sell their soul to the enemy. And I had heard that before that. No. My, it's it's not mine to give. Jesus owns it. God owns it. Right. You can't loan it. You can't lease it. And you certainly can't sell it. You know, I say, you may have heard Satan's a liar. He'll tell you, I've got it. I've got your soul. And he just wants you to despair. Because if you despair, you go to hell. Mm. But if you don't believe him, all you have to do, what you've done is that you've given your will to Satan. All you've got to do is go to confession and give your will back to God. It's just that simple. Now, you might need a deliverance. You might need an exorcism. But either one of those doesn't mean that Satan has your soul. But in your 12-year-old mind, this is what you're doing. You're 13 at this point. Sorry, you, you signed this at 13. Well, the issue with being 13 is that, as you know, all 13-year-olds know everything, and you can't teach us otherwise. Right. So 13 years old, I'm thinking I know it all. I signed all this stuff. So on a night when we have almost everybody that's a coven member is there, so there's almost 150 people there, I show up in a white robe. Now, I don't show up in it. I'm there, and I put on a white robe. And that signifies you're losing your innocence. Then you are baptized in a giant demon skull, um, so full, full submersion. Uh, they pull you up. You're covered in blood. You then walk into another room, take a shower, and come out in a black robe with the cowl raised, signifying you've been baptized into a world of darkness. So you come out of the out of the shower room. And I'm wearing a black robe with an inverted red uh, pentagram on it. And I sit in a chair. Uh, they read off the five-page document you signed three times the night before in your own blood. 
and then they intertwine the document with this wheel, which looks like a peace sign now. And they say this is going to go into a vault and it will remain there forever. And that eventually you're going to die and go to hell. And that, and now there's a party to celebrate that you're now a Satanist. And then I had to sneak home that night. I had snuck out that night. I had to sneak home again and uh, sneak into my bed because I had to be up for church the next day. Wow. So that happened when I was 13. When I was 14, I was turning 14. Now, what also happened that night is that somebody came up to me and gave me the red road. Anybody can do magic. Anybody's allowed to do magic. But you're not the official magic practitioner unless you wear the clothes of the magic practitioner. So the red robe is the magic practitioner. It's called the mage. And it's a red robe with a black inverted pentagram. I wanted the red robe and they gave me the red robe. And so I put that on. So to me, that was a cause for a celebration. Now I was an a official satanic covenant member, but I got the red robe and I thought that was the coolest look ever. And then when I was 14 years old, um, they told me that I needed to practice stabbing. They gave me a scalpel and they said, we want you to practice stabbing a ball of Play-Doh or an orange or an apple because you're going to participate in an abortion. And then I went home to look up the word abortion because I had no idea what it was. The only thing I knew about the word abortion is that my parents whispered it one time. So I thought it was a dirty word. So I went back to my coven and I went up to another guy that I trusted. And I said, hey, I heard that I have to commit an abortion, but I don't know what that means. And he goes, oh, you're killing a baby in the womb. I was like, is that legal? He goes, oh, yeah. In the womb, legal, out of the womb, murder. Now, when I got there this night, this happens also late in me being 14. It was a few months before turning 15. All of our abortions were late term. So this is in a farmhouse. It's in a member's farmhouse. And I will like to go on record here as saying that that member's farmhouse was more sterile than any abortion mill I've been in since then. You know, it, it takes spiritual warfare. You have to fight a spiritual battle spiritually. And Catholics and Christians are not up on things like that. They don't realize that they have to fight it spiritually. And, you know, I, I think one of the issues that we're facing right now is that not everyone knows spiritual warfare. They do not know how to protect themselves, how to protect their families. They don't know what to do. And I and that, find it very sad that we go to church and right. the church doesn't even tell you that we have an enemy of our soul. And if they do, it's very minimized. We um, have a prayer that we say at the Novus Ordo Mass. There's a prayer and it's, well, it's at the beginning of the prayer where you believe in things that are visible and invisible. And invisible. What do you think invisible means? It's true. What is that? Is that Casper the Friendly Ghost? No. Invisible. The angels, demons, God, the Holy Spirit. If it's holy or unholy and you can't see it, it's invisible. Right. We're not reading scripture. We don't know how but to there's so it many, spiritually. Even there's though so there's many. information out there. And 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 I just can speak um from my experience. I had to research. I had to look. I had to see. When, when God says, seek and you shall find him, I had to seek. I seek the poor information. I had to find out why is all of this? Why is my life going up in flames? What's going on? <laughs> my wife did the same thing. Yes. When my life started to go up in flames, that is when I said, no. I'm I'm a good girl. I'm going to church. I'm re I'm praying my rosary, but my life is going up in flames. What's going on here? That's when I started to 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 actually research, and then I came across this whole dimension that for me it was mind blowing. That is this real? This can't be real. 
is, is this really happening? No. And it for me, it took me a lot of reading, a lot of research to come to this realization that I need to fight spiritually. I've been fighting in the flesh and now it's time. These things are real. Binding prayers are real. This is, I, I start listening to, to podcasts, to YouTube. I start listening to these priests following and I'm saying, oh my goodness, this is all real. I've let the enemy in my life. And this is why, you know, this is happening. But so many people are so unaware that things are happening in their life because they have an enemy of their soul who is coming in in a disguised way into their lives and destroying well, everything. A lot of the times now he's not in a disguised way. He just steps right in. Oh, yes. People don't believe and they don't know they're being spiritually attacked. Right. People have been taught, oh, you got a flat tire today when yesterday all your tires were fine. And today you've got a flat tire, you run out of gas or your car is having a problem that it's never had before. Now, and they don't correlate that with they're supposed to go to confession today. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, they've, they've just been taught that, oh, you're having a string of bad luck. Or somebody hasn't been to confession in 25 years, and they've got weird stuff happening in their house. So, and they're Catholic. So what they do to solve the stuff that's moving in their house and the black shadows that they see in their house when they wake up and they're seeing something that looks like uh, it's a black figure with a cloak and a hat, but there's nobody in the house that looks like that, but that shadow's on their wall. So they contact a voodoo practitioner and a psychic, and the psychic tells them to sage their house. Or a curandera, the way we call it in Belize sometimes. You go to a curandera. Which is like lighting a neon sign that says demons come here. Mm -hmm. And then their house gets worse. And they can't understand it because the psychic said, if I sage the house, it'd make it fine. Right. And so they contact somebody else. They contact a hoodoo person. And now they've got 10 times the demons they had and they don't understand it. So then they find another witch and they ask them or a bruja. And Every person they contact makes it worse. And now it's been 40 years. They haven't been to confession in over 40 years. Their life, they're at the end of their rope. Stuff is happening. Stuff is like when they get home, they've got stuff that's just full on moving in their house all around them. They're not scared of it anymore because they've been seeing it for 15 years. But they would like to know what is the last i've got one more i've got the strength to call one more person who can i possibly call and they decide that they're going to look up something on youtube and say they want to look up now i bring this up as an example because this happened to somebody in their sin they decided they wanted to watch they did they were tired of looking at porn they thought they could wean themselves off porn by watching videos of girls in bathing suits on YouTube. So he started watching this and he just put it on continual play. My YouTube channel came up, mm -hmm. but he played it. And it was me talking about a cursed object. And then he started listening to all my videos. And at that time there was about 70 of them. And he stayed up all night playing all of these. And one of them, I list my phone number. So he called me. I said, you tell me your story. Just start it from beginning to end. I'll just sit here quietly and listen. Every once in a while, I might have a question, but go ahead and just go. So he talks to me, tells me this whole tale of woe. Now he's like 60 years old. And all this has been happening for the last 40 years. And I'm the last phone call. So after 40 years of involvement and all this stuff and being Catholic the whole time, they finally come to me. And my first question is, how many years has it been since you've been to confession? It had been 45 years since his last confession. Wow. I said, do you know you could have stopped all of this from happening to yourself had you gone to confession 45 years ago? 
or at any point along the way. I said, you need to make an appointment for a priest to come over and bless your house. You need to have confession that same day. So you need to clean yourself and clean your house in the same day. Mm -hmm. You might need a deliverance and your house might need an exorcism. Well, let's get started first things first. As a now, if you want to prove that spiritual warfare is real, you're on the other side right now. You can see that demons are real. If demons are real, then angels are real. Demons and angels didn't create themselves. It means God is real. But since you have demons, you know Satan is real. I said, what are you going to do next? He said, I'm looking up the priest, looking up the appointment times. I said, you can't show up for confession. You have to call the priest and set up an appointment time. And he's like, why not? I said, because it's not fair to everybody else in line that you're going to get in line and you haven't had confession in 45 years. Mm -hmm. That means no one after you is going to get to go. And I guess this brings up the power of confession. When I learned about the power of confession and trying to stay, remain in a state of grace, I started to do confession at least once a month. And as often as I could. Um, I try and do it. I try and do it every seven days. I can't always, but I don't sin now that I'm married and have kids. I don't sin nearly as much as I used to. And if you want to do a good confession, Mr. King has his website. Um, what's your website again, Mr. King? AllSaintsMinistry.org. AllSaintsMinistry.org. Contacts and links page that lists a examination of conscience form PDF. So if you want it, you can download it and print it. And it's from Ignatius Press. And it lists the Ten Commandments and then what falls under each. So like under Thou Shalt Not Kill, it'll list 30 other things that fall under that same category. The first time I saw this examination of conscience form, I was at confession. My wife was getting one and going through with a pencil. And I said, what's that? And she told me what it was, and I thought, I'm already here for one sin. I've only created one, I've only done one sin. Uh, I don't need the examination of conscience form. But curiosity got me, and I thought, well, let's see what's on there. And I went down that list and started checking stuff off. I didn't know were sins. And, you know, the next person in line goes, hey, it's your turn. I said, no, go ahead and go. I'm still going down this list. And I let like three or four people go ahead of me. Because I was going down, I ended up marking like 35 things. So it's really important to do a good confession, examination of conscience. Yes. Please go to the Alphine's website and download it and get a good confession. Because that in itself, like Mr. King said, it's a mini exorcism and it brings healing and restoration to your soul. Another thing, not not as strong as that, but it will bring a lot of healing to you. And a lot of people have this wound, uh, not forgiving somebody, holding on to your anger against somebody that has wronged you. I mean, people will hold on to something somebody did to them when they were five years old. And now they may not even remember what the wrong was. They just remember who it was. And in the Our Father, it says, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us, which... You may have said it a thousand times, but not realize that what it's saying is you have to forgive everyone, then God will forgive you. And imagine how healing that would be for some people. And, and I just want to, to state here as well that forgiveness is an act of the will. I'm choosing to forgive. It's not about how I feel. But I'm making the decision today to forgive this person that has hurt me and then pray for them so that the feelings can align. 
but I'm choosing to forgive this person that deeply hurt me. Every project has to start somewhere, and Brothers Habet's got you covered. We're the place for professionals because we understand success is built on quality and reliability. For the do-it-yourselfers seeking quality tools and materials to bring their out-of-the-box ideas to life, our paint department offers a kaleidoscope of hues to those looking to express their unique style. And for those seeking the perfect touch of elegance for their homes, we offer a curated collection of household fixtures and furnishings that caters to every taste. But what sets Brothers Habet apart is our exceptional customer service. Our employees go above and beyond to ensure that every customer's needs are met. We're here to see you through your building journey. Visit Brothers Habet and get started today or call or WhatsApp us for a quote. See you soon. If you've been considering purchasing real estate in Belize or perhaps just making an investment for future retirement plans, if so then Matos Real Estate Limited, Belize's trusted real estate firm can assist you with the acquisition of Belize's finest real estate available in the market. Centrally located in Belize City, Matos Real Estate Limited is full-service real estate company dedicating itself in the sale of commercial and residential properties, island properties, developed farmland, acreages, seafront and sea view properties. Their focus is not just within Belize City. They also represent Belize real estate in the various districts and villages of the country. Contact them at 615-5886. Babe, I'm going out to pay the water bill. You don't need to go out. You could pay it from your phone. Look. Babe, the credit card bill. I'll go pay. You can also pay it with your phone. Babe? Yes, love? I need to go deposit the baby service pay. You really want to go out, don't you? It's okay. I will make the transfer and you go play ball. With Atlantic Bank Mobile, your personal banking experience is easier and more convenient. Bank your way with any of our digital channels and save time for what matters most. Atlantic Bank, building the future together.